Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Welcome back to Moonbeaming, a real live podcast that talks about real live things that real live humans go through through a compassionate and curious lens. I'm your host, Sarah Faith Godestiner, who is also the creator of the Moon Studio or a business, an online store, and education center to help support you in any phase. You can check out our classes, courses, our awesome apparel, and other lifestyle goods and spiritual tools by going to moon-studio.co. If you're new here, welcome. Maybe this might not want to be the first episode you listen to because it's about hard things. But maybe just maybe you're here because you saw the title of this episode and we're like, yep, that's the one. That's it. In that case, love. And hello. If you've been here for a while, thank you so much. I am honored and grateful for your presence and your attention. I do not take it lightly. If you've been here for a while, you know that every year we do deep dives into the cards of the year as a way of getting more familiar with the tarot to ground us in reality by way of the energetic and metaphysical, something to give us a sense of what to expect and to assure us that no, we aren't going insane. And yes, there are maps in existence that we can use as a guide. And so we've done some episodes on the chariot, which is our card of the year. You can go back and listen to those. And then we did an episode on the tower, which is in the chariot constellation. It is the chariot's teacher card. And so I wanted to follow that up with some conversations with folks that relate. Last week, we had one on collapse with wonderful guest Carmen Spagnolia. And next week, we will have another one with a guest about how to unhook from the ego and create more compassion and consciousness and some other great subjects. But here now, we're with a tower adjacent tower theme tower flavor episode entitled how to survive a spiritual crisis this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart i wrote a zine about it in fact a long time ago it might have been 2017 2018 it's because it's something i've gone through many times in my life and I wanted to share about it. I think people go through spiritual crises many times in their life. I think I'm going through one now, could be. I'm probably going to be going through many more or at least a couple more. I don't think enough people talk about it. I do think it is part of being a person who is constantly changing and growing and adapting and wanting to reinvent themselves. I do think this happens to folks who are paying attention and who are conscious and who are sensitive and who are aware. And I think we should talk about it more. Why? Well, when we talk about things more, it takes the shame out of it. We feel less alone. When we talk about it more, we also understand that, in fact, many people are going through it. I talk to a lot of people by nature of my job, or should I say, I hear from a lot of people by nature of my job, and many people are in it. They're in an existential crisis. They are dealing with really, really impossible and difficult things, and I think we can look around and think that we're the only ones going through it. And then if we're the only ones going through it, then we're alone and or there's something wrong with us that if we were more together, if we were more okay, then 
everything would be okay. And we're living in such challenging, unraveling times that it makes sense that we too are unraveling. And there are gifts in that as well. And it's a distinctly tower theme. It's also, of course, a distinctly chariot theme because the chariot is about becoming and getting off the beaten path and doing what we want to do on a self level, capital S self or capital spirit self, not necessarily what our families want us to do or what society tells us we should do. It's about what is calling to us. And sometimes that means having to confront some real internal and even external conflict. So in this episode, I'll define what a spiritual crisis is from my perspective. I'll go through some adjoining concepts and some ways to think about dealing with some kind of crisis, some practices that can help you navigate tower times and maybe just times of transition, change, and overall spikiness. If that sounds okay, say okay, okay, and let us begin. Let's start off by defining what a spiritual crisis is. There are two vastly different definitions. I'm only going to focus on one of them today, although I'll name both of them now. A spiritual crisis is a rupture with your sense of self, your sense of the world, and often there is a loss of a belief system, a loss of grounding, and with those things, a loss of hope and a loss of connection to yourself and to spirit, to source, to God, to nature, to your big why, and so on and so forth. There is often anger at the world or God or whatever you might have previously connected to or relied on. It's an earthquake. It's like a life, psychic, psyche, emotional, self earthquake. Often, these are brought on by tower kind of events, which we got into a lot last episode. These are diagnoses, a divorce, a job loss. We also talked about in the tower episode, an encountering of some kind of information or truth that completely changes the way you see the world. Getting information that confirms that someone you deeply trusted was lying to you, which is connected to maybe community or safety. Realizing everything you thought you were building or everyone you thought you were caring for or in a relationship with, they weren't building with you. They were using you. That's happened to me, and it totally rocked my world in a way that I'm still recovering from. So something happens that completely decimates certain certainties, right? Certain beliefs you've had about yourself, where you are going. Another example that's popping into my head, there's an athlete who gets an, a serious injury and they can't play anymore. Or someone goes to law school but cannot pass the exam. I'm thinking of everyone who is now disabled because of COVID. And on and on and on. It's a break, a rupture, something that is an earthquake in your life, and it changes the way in which you see and interact with reality. These are some of the most unspeakable, 
hardest things we have to go through. And we often go through them alone because for one, our culture does not like to talk about these kinds of things. And for two, while you know that one of my values is about being in community and being intimate and vulnerable with people and the connection we find in doing so. Often, it truly is about going through something where we have to learn how to go through it on our own because we have to learn how to be with ourselves in a radically different way. Of course, we can rely on the support and love of other people. We have to, we need to, we need one another. You know, we need to seek out groups or therapy or connections with other people and be able to ask for help. And also, we have to be able to find that sense of groundedness or self-love or acceptance or centeredness in ourselves. No one can do that for us. People can help us. We can be helped by therapy or by a loved one. But ultimately, it is on us to have to ask for help or find the right medication or make the call to leave a certain relationship or situation or find another doctor or whatever it may be. So that's the first kind. That's the one I'm really going to be referring to today. But the second I'll briefly go over. We talked about it also in the Tower episode, so I'm not going to spend too much time here, but it's a spiritual crisis that is more of a spiritual awakening where there is a spontaneous change brought about by spiritual experience. It can be small, like feeling your heart open in a meditation. It's not small, but you know what I mean? Like so many people want the big explosion, the big firework when Really, we know that existence is so much more subtle and smaller, you know, than some major firework. But so let's say you have that that heart opening moment in a meditation or at a yoga class or, yes, these larger experiences like kundalini or a near death experience. Maybe you have a brush with God and going to a religious service, maybe you even see a ghost and you think, wait a minute, there's more to life. Like there's different planes of existence. Now what am I going to do? Maybe I don't believe in God, but maybe I believe in a different kind of existence, right? These kinds of initiations and invitations that open us up to the metaphysical, the mystical, the spiritual, which is often a positive tower experience and may shock us a bit for a while or longer. And it takes time to adapt to. And it also might be painful in its own way. It can be painful to carry on and have relationships with people who maybe don't believe in the same belief system you have. I think of the Zen saying, what do you do before enlightenment? Chop wood, carry water. What do you do afterwards? Chop wood, carry water. There's also often a real drive to be in service in some way after a spiritual awakening as well. We generally want to help people in some way. Similarly to the first definition also, this is a questioning of self and also maybe a period of grief, and also a period of integration, which might last a lifetime. So let's go back to the first kind, that challenging kind, the existential crisis that refers to a form of conflict that maybe then leads to some kind of inner conflict or inner separation. The first theme that came up for this year was conflict. And a lot of us are having conflicts, internal, external, 
come to a head in a big, important area of our lives. During an existential crisis, one questions the foundations of their life. Our idea of self is questioned. Our personal integrity is questioned. This is the tower card. It also in our culture can correlate to cultural milestones that people talk about, the quarter life crisis, the midlife crisis. I would posit that because of the times we're living in, especially going on the fourth year of a pandemic, you know, it really can be any time. Isn't that fun? Isn't that a wonderful reminder? It can be any time. In a lot of ways, this ends up being a maturation. And in a lot of ways, also, it can be a massive heartbreak. I also think about this idea of resilience in healing from trauma. Like you become a resilient person when you go through a lot of trauma. But also, I'm very sick of our culture trying to spin everything into like a hero, positive poly message. Because those of us who've been through trauma, we don't wish we had to go through those things to make us stronger. I think that's going to be a real theme next year with the strength card and like resilience and strength and soft power. Sorry, it's like my intuition chiming in from the future. But like, I don't wish what I went through on anyone else. But also, and also, we're here. Like, here we are, right? So there is this sense of how we grow and the sense of being forced to grow and change, even if it's really painful, even if it's not something we necessarily want to do. We have to in order to live a life that feels authentic and joyful and meaningful. But first, there's meaninglessness. There's a sense of dejection, a loss of connection, purpose, and motivation. Some of the symptoms that could show up is depression. But really, I would posit it's deeper than that, which is makes it difficult, especially for those of us who already have experience with depression. Depression is one of the symptoms, worry, anxiety, a lack of interest in what you previously liked doing or a lack of motivation around things you like doing. There's isolation and so on. You know, I've also been thinking, of course, about the pandemic and how so many of the ways that we had to stay alive and keep one another safe really set up the exact conditions for an existential or spiritual crisis the isolation, the loss of structure, all the unknown. I read somewhere once that long stretches of the unknown is so bad for our brains. We do our best when we're operating in kind of short term, like 90 day kind of periods, or when we have short term, like middle goals that take time, but they're not so far out of reach. This, of course, backs up all my work and all my teachings about cyclical living, seasonal living, and embracing the seasons more, right? Because the seasons are about 90 days. And if you're in an existential crisis, especially if there's that lack of connection to spirit, I encourage you to lean into nature, lean into the sun, lay on the earth, play with the elements, let the elements in, be in the present moment through spending time in the outdoors, if you can't leave your house, look out the window, connect with the sky, understand that you are nature and you are part of the one. And that goes into 
some tools that I came up with that we can cultivate, that we have to practice when we're in some form of crisis. In shorthand, I'm calling it the three A's. And the nature idea is synonymous with the first A, which is availability. We have to stay available to ourselves no matter what we are going through. In one of our last patron energy sessions, I talked about this idea that every interaction is a bid for connection. And often our learned behavior, our tendency can be, especially when we're stressed out, especially when we're in crisis mode, can be to override or avoid. We'll override our anxiety and power through. Or we'll get defensive, so we'll steamroll or gaslight inadvertently. Or we'll avoid the discomfort, the ringing alarm that is telling us this situation isn't aligned, and so on. When we stay available, I mean we are available to ourselves, our capacity. We don't abandon ourselves. We are here with ourselves. We can hold our hand over our heart and say, sweetheart, I love you. I am here. I will never leave you. Even if things are going so bad, even if you found out some really terrible news that you don't know how to process, you can still make it a practice to be loving to yourself. And you can still make your body a safe and relaxed space, a vessel for you to reside in without conflict. So availability, to stay available to yourself, to your truth is key. And then to become available to the situation. If we push through, if we ignore, that's not going to work ultimately. Cultivate availability around the situation and what it is teaching you. Often, life is teaching us. I would posit that life is teaching us constantly, whether we want to learn from it or not. Often, an aspect of a spiritual crisis is because we forget or think that we're separate. We're separate from the universe. We're separate from spirit or source or God. They say that the original wound is the wound of separation. All the gatekeepers around identity, religion, all the BS that we are taught that we have to do in order to find belonging, it's so real. And again, like when these things we do to get acceptance and belonging, to stay a, in quote, good person, when we do all the right things and still go through horrific tragedies or unfair events, it can make us feel unchosen, unloved, ignored, cast out, by spirit. Well, you'll hear the common refrain. I've I've thought this. I've definitely thought this. We'll hear why God? Why me? Why this? And honestly, I don't have an answer. Terrible things happen often through the hands of others, often because of unhealed violent people or even evil, just evil in the world. And sometimes things are random. An illness can be random and also due to environmental factors. Earthquakes and tsunamis and other forms of brutality happen in nature. If you've been abused or treated really poorly, it's not your fault. You must remain available to yourself and try as much as possible to stay kind to yourself. 
And going back to the nature idea, connecting to nature, connecting to plants, connecting to herbs, connecting to your pets is also one way to not feel so alone. The next A I want to bring up, the second A, is acknowledgement. Acknowledge you're in it. Acknowledge you need help. Acknowledge that your capacity is different now or what you're dealing with or thinking about is different now. If you can, write down everything you're unsure about, what you are uneasy about, what you're dealing with, and get it all out. All the emotions, all the confusion. Acknowledgement is also about clarity. Maybe try to get clarity around why you're confused. I'm confused because I got this diagnosis and it's making me feel dot, 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 because dot, 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 and really try to get the story out or revisit it from a different lens. Acknowledging that brings you into current time around your life, and it does help you proceed accordingly. I talk a lot about when I got my diagnosis of my illness, it made me look systematically, I don't know what the right word is, it just made me look at everything in my life and see where I was like wasting time, wasting energy in relationships that were not reciprocal or supportive thinking of the ways I treated myself and my body, and I had to make some major changes. So when you acknowledge it, when you don't deny it, when you don't put it off, and this could even be around a desire or a dream, when you're like, this is what I'm doing now, or this is what I want to spend more time doing now. You know, acknowledgement brings you up to current time in your life. You can't hide it away. You have to address it. The other piece about acknowledgement is acknowledging the resources you do have, the things you are grateful for, the things that ground you in the darkness. Maybe it's rituals or a TV show or a morning walk or your nice housemates or morning bird song. That's been a big one for me lately. Life is always a both and. You don't have to stop living when things go totally haywire. This is like one of the practices of my life. I've been in it probably lifetimes because it's the opposite of perfectionism. Don't wait to have everything all figured out in order to live. It's through that figuring out, the experimentation, the trying, the following of urges, the appreciation of what is working. That's when you probably end up coming to some sort of idea about what to do or how to be. Acknowledgement is also about acceptance. Humans notoriously need resolution. We need resolution in order to move on. And the thing is, the tower goes on. There's a life after the tower. In fact, the card after the tower is the star, this homecoming, this soul retrieval. There's life after your diagnosis or after your assault or whatever else has happened. We're more than what has happened to us. So we have to find acceptance around what happened. And that acceptance also brings us into this through line of presence and love and self-affirmation. How can you make some kind of resolution for yourself through operating in acknowledgement, availability, acceptance? And I'm going to talk about acceptance as well in terms of healing. Before I talk about the healing spiral, which is what I wanted to talk about in this episode, I want to highlight my discomfort with the concept and the term and the word healing. Do I believe in healing? I do. Do I believe that there is 
the idea that every single thing in our life can heal, that there's the possibility of everything in our lives healing. So we reach this point of healed. I don't. And I say this because I have really terrible injuries where I've done like so much for them and they've never healed. I continue to do so much for my injuries and they may or may not heal. And I've given up all hope while I still continue to treat them. I say this as someone who will never have the relationship I want with certain close family members. Years of trying, therapy, joint therapy, conversations, trying one way, trying the other way, boundaries, like all of the things, right? I've given up all hope. And I think that's really important because it brings us into acceptance, which frees us up. Because sometimes there's this fine line between hope and delusion. Like I personally wish I had given up on certain relationships that were consistently abusive and extractive way sooner, don't you? But I had that hope that things would change. We all do it. It's not wrong. I'm not talking about throwing people out or people are disposable, but we've all had those times where we think, if I changed, if I became more easygoing or tolerant or less like me, if again and again and again and again and again, I ignored their dot, dot, dot. If I was the bigger person, if I was more patient, if I had no needs, then it will work, right? Like cue laugh track, cue sad, kind, sweet, adorable laugh track from the universe, right? Because we've all been there. And it's hard to know when to stay and when to leave. One thing to ask yourself is, if this person never changed, if this situation never changed, no matter how much work or change you did, would it be enough? And sometimes the answer is yes. Yes, it is. Yes, this relationship is too important and meaningful and you can learn so much from it and you're not going to let it go. If you're holding on, though, because you're in scarcity mode, we've talked about this in Embodying Abundance, if it feels obligatory, if you're afraid someone's going to judge you, if there are some other key indicators that this is not a reciprocal or healthy situation, if you're on Groundhog Day, it might be time to take a step back. We can also use this question on ourselves with buckets and boatloads of compassion. I shared with some protection magic folks in one of our gatherings, I told them a conversation I had with myself. I am in almost constant chronic pain due to said injury and my chronic illness. And I asked myself, if my pain never changed, if my body never changed, what would I do? What would I do differently? How would I be with myself? And immediately the answer came back as, I'd only love myself more. I'd dance more. I'd treat myself so well. I'd be so kind and so compassionate to my body. And immediately there was so much relief and such an intimacy, a coming together instead of a pulling apart or a large separation, you know? Because to wish for things to be better or different takes us right into scarcity, pulls us right out of the present moment, creates the separation within us that puts us on the hamster wheel of lack. When this thing happens, then all, so on and so forth. That day may never come. So what is here? What is available to me now? How can I act in presence, in kindness, in current time towards that which I want? And what is attainable for me to do today? 
or to do little by little, bit by bit every day? What micro move can I make that connects me to the macro? If you're here, you probably believe that as practitioners, we can transform our energy. You probably understand, at least conceptually, if not in your own life, you understand how we're all one and how we're all connected to the whole. And you probably believe that what we do matters. If you believe what we do matters, then you need to believe that what you do matters and how you do them matters. And you need to do things and be in energetic states simply because you are the one experiencing them. I'm always asking myself, how can I make this more fun? How can I make this more pleasurable? No one else is experiencing it but me. And perhaps in time, the people I interact with. I'm constantly doing this, like multiple times a day, coming back to the present moment, resetting my energetic field, beginning again and again. I had someone recently just tell me, you know, they like my energy or they like the energy of this podcast. And I said, I'm really glad because before I sit down and record, I set my energy to my intention. And that, you know, I know I haven't talked a lot about witchcraft on this podcast because I actually pretty much stopped doing magic heavily in 2020 and started focusing more on energy work. And also, an energetic reset is a very effective spell. It's magic. It creates magic on multiple levels, as far as I'm concerned, because also we remember that the definition of magic is the ability to change consciousness at will, the ability to transform our energy. And you can do that at any time, no matter what situation you're in. This is really also nuanced. I believe we have to experience grief when we're in really, 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 really hard situations. We know that grief is like a wave. It just keeps going and going. I'm on no level saying to ignore really horrible things. I'm in no way saying don't be angry. Be angry. Get mad. Feel your grief. Feel sad. Allow it to flow through your body so that you can process it. It's real. So have those real emotions. And also, at least for myself, like I said, as someone who's had very scary diagnoses, near-death experiences, lives in chronic fatigue and pain, I can decide how I want to be with myself, how I want to be with my body, how I'd like to run my energy, And what I can do within my capacity, which is also the same as going back to our sphere of influence. Another solution or way forward is found in the archetypes of the chariot and tower themselves. And I promise now I'm going to get into the healing spiral. I know I I take detours. I take detours. We drive. We take the long route. You know this. In both the chariot and the tower, there's this zooming in and a zooming out, a zooming in and a zooming out. We may wish to get really small and start really, really simple and then get really big. We may wish to just concentrate on finding the smallest glimmers, the smallest little bits of things we can do that feel attainable to us to practice. We might wish to begin with micro meanings of purpose, and then over time we can expand. And also, zooming out could be really helpful because what a spiritual crisis or an existential crisis or any kind of rupture 
can do is send us onto the healing spiral. The idea of the healing spiral is that we circle through various aspects of our existence that are important to find resolution around or repair around that are both universal and individual. So these ideas about belonging or purpose or self-love or community or potential, all of these larger things that we both need, I would posit, right? Need in order to live a whole, robust, rich life. All these experiences that we come back around to again and again in our lives change as we change and as we encounter and take action around them in different and perhaps deeper or more authentic ways. Think about the moon, for example. I've taught this in my classes. I have written about this in my books. A new moon happens around every 28 odd days. But who we are and how we feel about the concepts of the new moon, the themes of the new moon, they change depending on what we've learned, what we're experiencing so on and so forth. I mean, this is why the moon has been one of my guides because the moon is a grounding force. For some, it's the whole cosmos and the stars. For some, it's the seasons and the cycles. For some, it's rituals. It is traditions, right? These are all grounding techniques. I also think of the healing spiral as the fractal. When we think about themes of childhood or who we were as a child, because our child self is our most ancient self, it's the part of us who's been here on the earth the longest, and that's why inner child healing and reparenting is so important. And often we can deduce what we need by what was withheld from us or what we were interrupted in doing as a child, that is probably what will bring us into repair with ourselves and others as adults. What we needed most, if we go after that and individuate around some of those needs and interests, will bring us into repair and more wholeness. If you are in a spiritual crisis, take stock of your specific set of things that you cycle back around and around and around. Maybe it's around vulnerability or creativity or security or abundance or self-love or all these things I named. What are some ways that you can actualize around these things? I would gently encourage you to start with one or two, right? Don't start with all the things. That's just going to overwhelm you. And if your crisis is bringing up feelings of lack or confusion, how can you interact with yourself first in a different way in the ways in which you need to belong to yourself, in the ways in which you need to feel more secure within yourself or more expansive within yourself? Start there. Again, because we we will go into these certain themes and get chances to revisit certain themes again and again. So what have you been avoiding or ignoring that feels painful yet necessary? A self-care routine or a ritual practice? Asking for help? When we go into that discomfort, into that idea, and again, we don't override it and we don't avoid it, that will teach us more or that will give us often the next right step or inkling of direction as well. The spiral emphasizes this idea about whether we'd like it or not. We know this, like this process is not linear. Grief is not linear. A spiritual crisis is not linear. There's no tidy one and done way to fix everything. And when we push 
to have something fixed or over with, no matter how painful it is, right? No matter how much we want to stop experiencing that shame, that pain, that discomfort, avoiding it or ignoring it isn't good because our bodies need the release of that. We do need to feel it in order to heal it. That is true. It's annoying, but it's true. We need a compassionate witness. We need to be there for ourselves in a different way. I was talking to my rabbi about the tower and what the point is of crisis or what some of the potentials are of crisis. And because he's Jewish, we were talking about this large tragedy that happened in Jewish history, which is the destruction of the temple. We were also discussing folklore and another tower, the Tower of Babel. And he was saying, well, people building that tower were looking the wrong way for God because heaven begins a millimeter off the ground. Malkut, which is the last Sephora, is the ground itself. So if you want to be closer to source, the ground is a great place to start. Get grounded, get available, acknowledge. And part of the story of what happened after the temple was destroyed was prayer. All of a sudden, with this structure being gone, everyone got a direct line to the heavens. This is when prayer proliferated, when personal ritual proliferated. After this painful shattering of a vessel, we were asked to create sparks inside of our own vessels. And that also brings me to the last A, which is adaptability. Spiritual crisis allows our spiritual vessels to widen and simultaneously remember who we are and or remember who we want to be, right? Like, who do you want to be in all of this? I remember I had this situation happen once and I was acting, I was in a beautiful place and I was having like a mini spiral, And on the last day there, thankfully I was alone. And the last day there, I thought to myself, I don't want to be in beautiful places and not appreciate them and not be at peace in them and not be in harmony with them. That's not who I want to be. And again, I'm not talking about bypassing myself or not letting myself feel feelings But I do think that there is a point in which we need to find levity. We need to find ways to access gentle peace and be grounded and understand that we grow around the grief. It widens us. We widen into compassion. The other thing my rabbi reminded us is it's a crisis because we can't yet see where it's going to get us. We're so in it, right? We're so in it. We're tossed. We can't yet see where it is going to deepen us or widen us. So we have to let it widen us. That's where the zooming out comes. It softens us or it breaks open the parts of us that need to be broken in order to open up so we can fill it with more appropriate energies, dreams, ideas about who we might be, about what this life might be for. The vessel, 
ultimately makes space for the light. That vulnerability is what makes space for the light. And that is the last A. And that's adaptability, right? So like we're adapting to what is now. We're adapting to who we want to be now. We're adapting to the messages now. We're thinking about what our form of prayer might become after we have processed through availability, through acknowledgement, acceptance, and we adapt. Humans are remarkably adaptable. So you can ask yourself, like, okay, what is this crisis calling me towards? How can I adapt? Understanding that you are infinitely innovative, that you are infinitely creative, what is it time to do? Right? Adaptability. The vessel ultimately makes space for the light. The vulnerability is what makes space for the light. The ground is clear. There's a new foundation. And there are some openings, some awakenings. So you can also ask yourself, what am I learning from this? How is the situation calling me to be more adaptable? What can I do differently? Who do I want to be? What do I need? What am I learning? And what is my capacity? I could talk about this subject forever. If you want me to do more episodes on this or similar, drop us a line, let us know in a review. Maybe another will bubble up this year. If you're an editor and might be interested in a book about this, message me. If you're a podcaster and would like to have me on your podcast to talk about this topic, email the studio. To all my friends listening, hopefully this has helped you. If this has, and you know someone who might benefit from it, send them this episode. Let them know you're thinking of them. People are going through it, and we all need all the affirmation and resources we can get. If you haven't already subscribed or written a review for this podcast, could you do so? People who leave us five-star reviews get entered in a drawing to win a free reading with me. We'll be announcing a winner soon, so be sure to leave that review. That's what I've got. I will be back really soon with a great episode you're going to love. Until then, be kind to yourself. Do something nice for someone else. And I will see you soon. Bye.